the Python testing from uh, UI UC. All right, uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. So I'll be talking today about, <coughs> I'll maybe begin by uh, uh, talking about two uh, transformations, uh, dynamical systems associated with uh, regular continued fractions. So I'm gonna talk about uh, continued fractions of the form bracket A1, A2 is equal to one over A1 plus one over A2, and so on and so forth. And they're gonna be uh, regular continued fractions, so all of our digits are going to be uh, natural numbers. And so the first uh, transformation I wanna talk about is the Gauss map which is, has a lot of um, connections to continued fractions. It is an inter uh, a map uh, from the interval 0, 1 to itself. And it is defined by sending g of x is equal to the fractional part of 1 over x for non-zero x, and we'll send uh, 0 uh, to 0. And so uh, this map is a measure-preserving uh, transformation with respect to the measure d nu, which is log 1 over log 2 times uh, dx over 1 plus x. Uh, maybe I'll draw a quick graph of what g of x looks like here. So, okay. And then as uh, it gets closer to the origin, these branches get steeper and steeper. Okay, and so uh, in terms of continued fractions, uh, what this map does is that if we uh, act on A1, A2, and so forth, what it'll do is it'll simply take off the first uh, digit and shift all, uh, all of the rest of the digits over. Okay. And so this uh, Gauss map has been used uh, to, dis uh, to study a problem also uh, named after Gauss is uh, posed by Gauss. And uh, his question, well, um, to start off with, uh, for any alpha in the interval 0, 1, he was able to prove that uh, the set of uh, the, Lebe uh, the Lebesgue measure of the set of all continued fractions, uh, such that if you take off the first n digits, and, that's, and the resulting fraction that you get is greater than or equal to alpha, he was able to prove that as n goes to inf uh, infinity, that this will actually converge to the new measure of uh, the set alpha 1. And so the question he posed was, can we get a good um, handle on what this error term would be? Okay. And so... Um, uh, lambda is the measure there? Yes. And so uh, this problem has actually been uh, worked on by quite a number of people, so I'll go ahead and maybe list them here. Uh, I think Kinch, uh, Kinchin, Kuzmin, uh, Levy, Viersing, Bobanko, And uh, Meyer and Ro uh, Meyer and Ropstorf. Okay, and so one of the main um, so in order to address this problem, I, maybe we can first notice that this set is simply equal to the nth inverse image of the set alpha one in the uh, Gauss map. And one thing uh, to notice is, um, so I guess, uh, um, so the, um, one of the primary methods for actually addressing uh, for how that, uh, for um, the asymptotics for that, set, uh, that measure is to actually look at the transfer operator of the Gauss map. And it can be realized as a map, I'll just denote it as a G hat and it can be uh, realized as a map from L1 of nu to L1 of nu. And its defining property is that if you integrate on a set B, uh, G inverse B, of a function F d nu, um, 
that is the same thing as integrating g hat f d nu on just the regular set b. And so that's the defining property of g. And so the thing to notice is that this lambda, um, this, uh, this measure here, is going to be equal to the integral from alpha to 1 of g hat, the nth power, of the function log 2 times 1 plus x d nu. And so this log 2 1 plus x comes from uh, this denominator here. And so um, it turns out that this transfer operator has nice properties. One thing to notice is that g hat of the constant function 1. Um, so maybe to fill in a little bit of a, a detail here, so this would be the measure of g in, uh, n alpha to 1. And then this is going to be, the Lebesgue measure is going to be log 2 times 1 plus x d nu. This, is, this whole thing is just d lambda here. And so we then just put uh, that power there. Okay. Um, so uh, this, um, so it turns out that g hat 1 uh, equals 1. So the constant function is an eigenfunction for g hat. And it turns out that um, there's a, uh, so g hat can be realized as a, an operator on certain um, spaces of functions where there's actually a spectral gap between the eigenvalue 1 corresponding to this and its lower eigenvalues. And so um, it turns out that this, this um, function here can, uh, is, is actually equal to 1 plus big O of Q to the N, where this corresponds to the eigenvalue 1, and then this would be lesser eigenvalues. Okay? Uh, and uh, Q, so let's see. Oh. Um, Q uh, can actually be numerically com computed. So Q would be the absolute value of the next eigenvalue less than 1. Yeah. So yeah, it actually turns out that um, I think by the, the work of Babenko and Meyer and Robstorff is um, that G hat can actually be uh, realized as a compact operator. And so it has countably many eigenvalues. And so this Q would be the next lowest one, or at least the absolute value of the next lowest one. And numerically, it's roughly uh, 3.3. Okay. All right. And so uh, the next, so, okay, so that's it for the uh, Gauss map for right now. The next uh, map I want to talk about is the ferry map. Okay. It's also a uh, transformation on the interval 0, 1. And it's defined by f of x is equal to x over 1 minus x if x is in 0 to 1 half. And it's 1 minus x over x if x is in 1 half to 1. Okay. And its corresponding measure uh, there's going to be a, a good difference between these two, two maps and how they behave. Um, this ferry map is actually going to have um, to be measure invariant, uh, or uh, yeah, measure invariant with respect to mu here, which is an infinite measure, whereas in, in this case we had a finite measure. Okay. Um, its con uh, connection with continued fractions is as follows: is if you act on a continued fraction a1 to a, uh, a2 and so forth. It'll subtract 1 from the first digit if a1 is at least 2. And otherwise, it'll just take off the 1 if 1 is the first digit. Okay. And so these maps look kind of similar. And one could, um, uh, maybe, maybe one thing that I could note here, actually, is Let's see. There is a pretty strong connection between the ferry map and the Gauss map, given that they look pretty similar. It turns out that um, the uh, uh, G can be realized as a return map uh, 
of f uh, to the set a equals, and I'll let a denote the set one half to one. And what is, this essentially means is that if we form the map f a, which is going to be uh, a set from a to itself, and uh, we define it by taking a point x in a, and we take an appropriate power, which I'll denote by phi a, a of x, uh, we iterate f a certain number of times until we get back to a. And so this is how, um, how I define f of a. It turns out that f of a and g of a are, uh, I guess, conjugate. Um, so. And that's actually a, a useful um, fact. Uh, we can use the strong um, ergodic properties of the Gauss map to actually say some things uh, about f as well. Uh, anyway, so um, we can come up with an analogous question. Uh, so uh, a question to the Gauss problem. Um, so instead of looking at the Lebesgue measures of these inverse images, what if we took a look at the Lebesgue measures of uh, the inverse images in the Ferry map? And another way of looking at this is what are the Lebesgue measures of the continued fractions such that if you take off um, n, or I guess one digit at a time, if you, you know, apply f n times, in other words, if we uh, end up with something of the form, uh, some a i is minus n, a k plus 1, a k plus 2, and so forth, k is just as big as necessary to make this uh, subtraction work out. So if we take a look at the big measure of this set, what, what's the asymptotic behavior of this? So instead of taking off n digits, you take off n itself from the front of the uh, continued fraction expansion. And um, so one case that I actually want to isolate in, in this situation is the case where um, alpha is equal to 1 half. And so we're looking at the situation in which our alpha 1 is equal to 1 half 1. And the important thing to notice about the set 1 half 1 is you can realize it as the set of continued fractions starting uh, with just a 1 here. And this is going to turn out to be what I'll call C1, which is going to be the first sum level set for continued fractions. And so I'll go ahead and define that now. So in general, we will let Cn be the set of all continued fractions, such that the sum i equals 1 to k of a i is equal to n for some k. Okay, so if you stop your continued fraction at any point, you'll get a sum of n. So this is what this set Cn is. And so, um, so the next thing to notice is that if we go back to our definition of what uh, the ferry map does, or uh, if we go back to these equations, it's fairly uh, clear that if we take Cn and act on it by f, we'll just end up with Cn minus 1. And the same thing, it's easy to see, occurs in the other direction. If we take the inverse image of Cn, we'll just get Cn plus 1, because we're either subtracting 1 or adding one in the front of the continued fraction. Okay? And so as a result, our Cn can be written as the n minus first inverse image in our C1, or I'll denote it by A. Okay? And so the ferry map, in fact, actually gives us a good uh, visualization for what these uh, sum level sets look like here. So. Let's see if I can graph it. So I'm going to go ahead and graph the third iterate of f. And so what's going to happen is that you're going to get branches, four different branches that look, each look like the ferry map. Okay. 
And if you take, say, one half here, I didn't draw that very well. And so these intervals down here uh, are what um, these summable sets are. So this set here is C3. Okay. And um, one can even uh, relate this to the Stern Brokaw uh, sequence um, to get a more precise estimate for those of you who are familiar with it. These endpoints in each of these intervals turn out to be um, uh, uh, points in the Stern uh, Brokaw sequence. And that establishes kind of another number of theoretic connection uh, between the ferry map and. Um, uh, yeah, and number theory. Okay, and so uh, going back to our question up here, what's the uh, asymptotic uh, behavior of these uh, sets? Um, it was um, uh, Kesselbrummer and Stratman who actually found out uh, the first uh, asymptotic, um, yeah, the overall asymptotic behavior of these sets. So. They proved that the Lebesgue measure of the nth inverse image of alpha to 1 is going to be equal to mu of alpha to 1 over log n, ah, sorry, asymptotic to, to mu of alpha, uh, alpha to 1 over log n uh, as n approaches infinity. And so, you mean the ratio goes to one? Yes, yeah, if you divide this by this, the ratio will go to one, yeah. And so, um, and so the, way, the way they did this is kind of analogous to how um, uh, um, we looked at uh, uh, the Gauss map was kind of considered. Uh, we can also consider the, um, the transfer operator, the ferry map. So we can rewrite this Lebesgue measure as this integral. And so I'm going to have phi 0 d mu, where phi 0 is just going to send x to x. And so phi 0 d mu is going to be the Lebesgue measure. And then we can look at this as the nth iterate of the transfer operator of f d mu. And so, um, and uh, I, I think I can go ahead and uh, actually uh, define explicitly what uh, f hat does. So if you take a function f, f hat will simply give you the following expression. And two important properties uh, that I want to, um, to mention at the moment. Uh, one is uh, immediate, is that if you take a function f and you have it act on 1, this is simply going to be f of 1 half. And then the second property that I want to mention at the moment is that uh, f hat maps the set of functions. So if you take the set of f in C2 of 0, 1, which are increasing, f prime is greater than or equal to 0, and they're concave down, uh, it will map uh, that set of functions to itself. And so in particular, one, um, one thing that's going to be pretty important is that all of these iterates are going to be increasing functions. Um, okay. uh, to get an idea of what uh, Kesselbrummer and Stratman did to prove uh, this asymptotic, I'll maybe give a quick outline. So the first step, um, which I can't summarize very, very well, um, is to use very re uh, generally results in infinite ergodic theory, uh, namely um, results of Aronson in particular. Uh, using these uh, general results, I'll maybe allude to them a, a little bit later. Um, uh, it is um, that they were able to prove 
that if you take the sum k equals 0 to n f hat k of phi 0, and you normalize it by some constant out in front, which I'll explain, uh, then this will converge uh, to just simply the integral phi 0 d mu equals 1. Okay. And so one may recognize uh, in certain contexts in ergodic theory where we're able to take the, um, the Koopman operator and iterate it on, on a function f. In this case, we're actually looking at the dual picture. We're taking the sums of uh, the dual iterates. Okay. Um, and so uh, this w sub n of a is called the wandering rate of A, and so it's defined as the mu measure of the sum k, uh, union k equals 0 to n of the kth inverse image of A. In our context, this just happens to be 1 over n plus one, uh, 2 to 1, and so this is going to be log n plus 2. Okay. So another thing that we want to notice, which follows uh, from these two properties here, is that the iterates of, of phi 0, when you restrict it to the set A, is going to be a decreasing sequence of functions. And because it's a decreasing sequence of functions and the log that's up here uh, is, is slowly varying, we would be able to actually um, uh, get an equality uh, uh, with only the nth iterate here. Uh, so uh, the bottom line would be that uh, W sub n of A of F hat n of, let's see, phi 0 uh, converges uh, to 1 as well. And I think I, I wanted to clarify here that this happens almost uniformly. On A and... Uh, this occurs here as well. This convergence is almost uniformly there. And so if we take, let's see. So if we take the integral of both sides of, of, um, of this uh, asymptotic here, what we'll end up with is just log n plus 2 of the Lebesgue measure of the Fn, uh, f minus n of a converges to log 2, because the on this side, the measure of A is log 2 in this instance. And so this actually completes the proof of this when alpha is equal to 1 half. Um, I'll go ahead and give a brief reason as to how to um, extend it to a smaller alpha. So if we were to pick, uh, so just for illustrative purposes, uh, if we were to take a subset of maybe just one, th uh, one third to one half, one thing that we can do is we can take the integral of this, f hat n phi zero d mu, and what we can do is we can take the uh, image of f uh, of b in f, and then take the inverse image of b, and integrate the same thing. And maybe going back, let's see. I suppose I must have forgotten to uh, to um, graph what uh, the ferry map looks like originally. I must have forgotten to, to write that. So this is actually what the first derivative of the ferry map looks like. Uh, if we were to take uh, our set B here and take its, um, sorry, it would be we're taking a forward image first. And then we're going to take an inverse image. Uh, when we do this process, we need to subtract off whatever this, this set is here. And so we'll just in, uh, subtract off the integral of f inverse f of b uh, uh, intersect a. Okay. And then what we can do here is we can just take off this f inverse and add an n. Uh, one to this n, 
and then we can just leave that as it is and because we have uniform convergence on, on this set and this F happens to map this B forward to inside A, we'll get uniform convergence inside here. And so we can uh, uh, use this to conclude um, that this will converge to the mu measure of B, or I guess it would be asymptotic to measure of B over log N here. And so that's how to extend it for all A. Okay. So. so now for the Gauss problem, um, they were able to get error terms in their asymptotic. They were able to get the uh, a certain constant that the, the Lebesgue measures of those sets go to, and they were able to get a constant term. So the question is, is can we get uh, an error term in this asymptotic? Uh, and it turns out that uh, that is the case. And so this is a start to finding the correct error term in this asymptotic. So if you take the, these Lebesgue measures, this is going to be equal to mu of alpha 1 over log n times 1 plus big O of 1 over log log n. So um, unlike the, uh, the case in the Gauss problem, it, it seems from the work of uh, Prelberg and Isola that the spectral behavior, the, the, the picture of the spectrum for the, um, for the map F hat seems to be a lot more complicated than that for the, uh, the Gauss map. Uh, and so looking at the spectrum uh, and eigenvalues and eigenfunctions doesn't seem to be um, maybe very, maybe very uh, easy. Um, but nevertheless, uh, looking closely at just some basic properties of, of the transfer operator, we're able to get, um, we're able to actually get that uh, error term. So um, I'll be uh, focusing on the proof of uh, that result for the, the rest of the talk. Uh, two immediate um, uh, simplifications that, that I'll make is that we'll just, uh, we'll just focus on the case alpha equal to 1. So we're just going to look at uh, the case for the sum level sets. And also, um, we're going to make use of the fact that these Lebesgue measures uh, are decreasing. And so this, uh, and so, um, through use of, of this logic down here where we took this together with this yields this, um, it suffices, using uh, this fact, we can just say it suffices uh, to show that uh, the sum k equals 0 to n Lebesgue measure of c k plus 1 is equal to n over log base 2 of n times 1 plus big O of 1 over log log n. Okay. This is not immediately obvious. Um, it basically follows from I would say these two facts. So let's see, where did I write that? So um, you can use uh, these two facts right here to show that these iterates are a decreasing sequence of functions. And then when you integrate them on uh, A, then you, you essentially get this right here, right? Um, yeah, this is just recalling that uh, this is lambda f minus k of, um, of A, which equals the integral on A of f k phi 0 d mu. And so yeah, these functions are decreasing. And so 
um, the Lebesgue measures are decreasing. So that's how you would prove that. Um, yeah, using this e equality, you can. Um, yeah, so let's see. I could explain that a little bit further. Um, so it comes down to the fact that um, if you take, the, say, the kth iterate of phi zero of x and you pick, uh, pick x and a, it's going to be less than or equal to the kth iterate, uh, the k minus first iterate phi zero, uh, sorry, kth iterate of phi zero at one, because this is increasing. And then um, this function itself is increasing. Then uh, you take off one from the power of, uh, of f hat, and then you'll have a one half here. And then you go up to x. And so it's those, yeah, so this is how. And um, yeah, so it follows from, yeah, both of these uh, properties here, and they follow directly from this equality. All right. Okay. So the key lemma, uh, kind of I think for this whole proof in finding the uh, error term, is that, uh, let's see, let's see, maybe before I get to that I need to make some definitions. Um, oh, oh, sorry, log base 2. I wrote n. Log base 2 then, sorry. Okay, um, all right, so to kind of start off uh, the proof of uh, this result, I'll just let A denote this, uh, let's see, A of sigma equals the sum, K equals zero to the floor of sigma of, let's see, I'm gonna make it log, uh, lambda of CK plus one over log two. Okay. And then I'm gonna let S be the Laplace transform defined on positive real numbers. It's going to be just the Laplace transform of A. And I'm writing it in this form, e to the minus n over sigma dA of uh, t, this is, sorry, minus t over sigma dA of t. Okay. And so, and uh, maybe one more definition, I'll let f hat sub n of phi 0 uh, be a function on 0, 1. And it's going to be uh, on x, it's going to map to k equals 0 to n of f to the power k, phi 0 of x. Okay. And so, the key lemma in, uh, in the proof, I would say, is that for each x in A, we have that f sub n phi 0 of x is equal to a sub n plus big, uh, a of n plus big O of 1. Okay. And so the proof of this would be um, to notice a couple of things. Uh, notice that that f hat n of phi zero is increasing because it's just a sum of, uh, let's see, increasing functions here. So it's an increasing function and its mu average is A of n. And this, uh, let's see, mu average will take place on A. Okay. 
So if you integrate with respect to a, you'll get uh, this function, you'll get a sub n. And so this means that if we take the difference between these two, that's going to uh, that's going to be at most uh, the largest point of this minus the smallest point of this function. So, so the difference between f sub n phi 0 of x minus a of n is going to be at most f n phi 0 of 1 minus f n phi 0 of 1 half. Rewriting what that means, it's the sum k equals 0 to n of f, uh, sorry, these should be subscripts, and then these should be superscripts. 1 minus f hat k phi 0 of 1 half. Okay. And then using a property that I erased a short while ago, we can uh, rewrite this as f k plus 1 phi 0 of 1. Okay. And so this ends up being a telescoping sum. And in the end, you get phi of 1 minus phi uh, f to the n phi 0 of 1. Uh, this is 1, and then this is just something that's uh, uh, greater than or equal to 0. So we get a bound of 1, and so that completes the lemma. And then immediate, uh, an immediate corollary to this, simply by uh, taking the Laplace transform of uh, this expression right here, you will simply get uh, the following. Uh, the sum n equals 0 to infinity, e to the negative n over sigma, f to the n phi 0 of x, is going to be equal to s of sigma plus big O of 1. And then this is, again, 4x in a. Okay. And so at this point, I need to uh, appeal to a theorem uh, uh, due to Aronson. And so um, it, uh, yeah. So um, Aronson's theorem uh, allows us to relate this, uh, um, this uh, expression of functions in terms um, of certain uh, other integrals. So let, let, let me go ahead and just maybe write that out here. So the theorem of Aronson is if we integrate on A this function right here, sum k uh, n equals 0 to infinity, e to the negative n over sigma of hat n phi 0. Okay. We multiply by 1 minus e to the negative phi sub A over sigma d mu. This uh, phi sub a is uh, something I wrote towards the beginning of, of the lecture. It has to do with the um, return, uh, the, gauss uh, the gauss map being the return map for the Fermi map. This is uh, the appropriate power that you must iterate f on a given point in a to return to a. Um, this big expression here is going to be equal to the sum n equals 0 to infinity e to the negative n over sigma integral a sub n. Let's see. And I'll go ahead and I'll, I wrote phi 0 over there, so I'll write, write uh, phi 0 again here. Uh, in fact, uh, we can replace these by f's um, for uh, appropriate functions f. Uh, in this case, uh, the a a with the subscripts are defined as follows. A0 is equal to A, and AN for larger N is going to be equal to the uh, nth uh, inverse image uh, of A minus the union of the smaller inverse images. And in this case, these are equal to 1 over N plus to so 1 over n plus 1, okay? All right. And so uh, using this theorem, we can certainly simplify this expression. Uh, this integral is just going to be replaced by 1 over n plus 2 times 1 over n plus 1. And so what's going to happen to this is it can be easily computed 
to be some, being something like uh, 1 plus big O of log sigma over sigma. Okay. So this side is a little bit more complicated. We need to um, manipulate it a bit more. But with uh, this corollary, the first step would be uh, replacing this, uh, this expression here with uh, S of sigma plus big O of 1. So we'll insert that there. So what we can do is we can rewrite it as follows. S of sigma plus big O of 1. Another trick that I want to do is to multiply by 1 minus e to the negative sigma. And then what I will do is divide by 1 minus e to the negative sigma um, as follows. We'll just write the following in. So um, this is simply equal to the reciprocal of this. <coughs> okay. And so um, now that we've wrote it again in this form, we can actually use this equality again, only replacing phi 0 by the constant function 1. And in that situation, let's see this big integral becomes the following expression. And so it's a Laplace transform of the log of 2 plus, uh, roughly the log of 2 plus x. And so what happens uh, to this function, it can be um, fairly easily uh, computed to be log, being a log of sigma plus big O of 1. Okay. And so we have, um, we now have a situation where we can uh, get a good uh, asymptotic expression for our Laplace transform uh, S of sigma. So we have S of sigma times something that we can kind of get a good asymptotic for is equal to another um, a nice expression there. And when the smoke clears, what we end up with is just S of sigma is equal to sigma over log sigma times 1 plus big O of 1 over log sigma. Okay. So that's what we get for the Laplace transform. And so for our last step, so we have an asymptotic for our Laplace transform. We need to appeal to a Taubarian theorem to go back to the original function. And in this case, uh, what I'll be using is Freud's um, effective version of Karamata's Taubarian theorem. And so I have a couple minutes to explain, uh, maybe just to summarize what uh, I do here. So uh, what we do here. So uh, the first thing to notice is that A of sigma, let's see, let me, let me actually start off by uh, defining the function chi. It's going to be a real valued function. Uh, to be chi of x is equal to 1 over x if x is in E inverse to 1. And it's going to be 0 otherwise. Okay. And then using this function, we can write s in terms of something that looks like it's Laplace transform. So in this case, a of sigma is going to be equal to the integral of chi e to the negative t over sigma e to the negative t over sigma dA of t. Okay. And so the idea of um, this Taubarian theorem, uh, th the proof, is to, to approximate this chi with polynomials. Okay. 
And so if we choose our polynomials well, we can uh, end up with a good error term. For now, I'll go ahead and just simply write this here. And what we can do is we can use our expression for s of sigma here to kind of transform this into to something nicer here. So just to illustrate uh, kind of how that works, let's go ahead and just uh, replace p here with uh, x to the n. So in this case, what we'll have is the following. We can recognize this as simply s of sigma over n plus 1. Okay. And then we, as long as we let, uh, don't let m uh, be too big, we can uh, use this expression here to uh, replace that. So we'll end up having sigma over log sigma 1 over m plus 1 plus big O of 1 over log sigma. Okay. And one key thing to, that we can recognize is that we can rewrite this 1 over m plus 1 in a creative way as this integral right here. And so what this process tells us is that we can maybe take linear combinations of expressions like this to create a polynomial here. And then we'll end up, once we take those linear combinations, we can maybe get a polynomial here. Okay? And so maybe using that process, we can re replace this approximately by p of e to the negative t, e to the negative t, dt. Okay. This approximation, so let's see, so maybe I should maybe uh, be more precise. So the idea of the polynomials that kind of underlie this proof is that we'll be uh, approximating the uh, chi from above and below by polynomials. And then the difference between P and Q, L1, are going to be small. So, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, so we want these, so we want these uh, integrals to, to work out nicely. So to, to get this approximation, well, we, we, want, uh, we want this L1 uh, bound. We, we actually want this to go to 0 as the degree of the polynomials go, uh, goes to infinity. Yeah, OK. OK. So at this point, we maybe can go back to um, uh, so we go back to the idea that we're picking polynomials that approximate chi, and so um, uh, yeah, choosing our polynomials approximately will, or, uh, well, we can say that this is about equal to chi of e to the negative t, e to the negative t dt. And for, let's see, I'm forgetting a law, uh, sigma over log sigma here. And I'm forgetting a sigma over log sigma here. And this uh, integral is identically equal to 1. And if uh, we follow these approximations more carefully, taking into account um, this L1 bound here, as well as making sure our, the coefficients, so when we, take, uh, when we take these approximations down here in particular, there's going to be coefficients in front of this um, that, uh, that might uh, make our error go out of bounds. Um, as long as we take care of those things carefully, which uh, Freud was able to do, we'd be able to get uh, a big O estimate of 1 over log log sigma in this whole process um, as we approximate A of sigma by sigma over log sigma. Um, and so that completes the proof. And I think that's about the end of my time, so uh, are there any questions? Yes? So in your theorem, you look at the measure of f minus n of alpha 1. Yes. Can you change 1 
Well, yes. Um, yeah, so I was kind of doing that for maybe comparison purposes with uh, the Gauss problem. But yeah, we can simply, you know, do a subtraction. So um, we'll have alpha to 1 here, and we can subtract off beta to 1. Yeah. And so that will give us just any inter interval that we want. Yeah. 